Int Park, Ont Moon, Int House. If you're from the north of England or you know people from the north of England, you might have wondered why they either don't seem to use the word the, or they reduce it so much in speech that it's almost not there. Um, and as somebody with, you know, half my family is Cumbria and I study in Preston, so I hear it quite a lot and it slipped into my speech occasionally, um, I thought it would be interesting to do a video on exactly why this happens and what it is. And I hope it's not too niche a topic. I don't think it is because I've done videos on Cumbrian and that's a niche topic um, than this. Um, so we'll start with a little bit of explanation about what the word the actually is. So the strong form of the word in standard English is the, and that's used when the next word starts with a vowel. So the apple, the onion. Or sometimes if you're trying to emphasise things. So for example, if you wanted to say um, it's not a mouse, it's the mouse. But in all of the situations, people tend to use the weak form, the. So the, 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 the. This is called the definite article, and it's used in conjunction with a noun. And I'll give you an example to show you how it's different from the indefinite article, a or a. If I said there's a cat in the house, I'm introducing the idea of the cat. So I'm assuming that the person I'm talking to didn't know there was a cat, uh, and I'm using the indefinite article, a. Uh. If I then said, the cat has left the house, I'm now using the, the definite article because the person I'm talking to knows which cat I mean. So I mean the cat I mentioned before. I'm now talking about a specific cat that we're both aware of. Plenty of languages don't actually have a definite article at all. So for example, Latin didn't have one. Um, Old English had a more complicated definite article that changed based on the gender and case of the noun it was modifying. Um, and I've done a video on the very, very basic elements of Old English grammar that covers this. And all of, all of those definite article forms in Old English had been simplified by the early Middle English period. And then you just had one form of the definite article that was the or the in unstressed form. And that's pretty much how we have things in modern English. But in the north of England, as I say, the definite article was reduced even more. And this seems to be something that happened in stages. So I'll talk for Cumbrian because um, that's what I know best. In the 14 and 1500s, you have the full form of the definite article, the, or the, as it's used in Southern English. In the 1700s, you get people in spelling reducing it to just th, probably pronouncing it like th or th. And you also get people in spelling reducing it to just the letter t, which probably reflects how it's pronounced in Cumbria now. Um, in parts of Lancashire, you still find the th pronunciation, so you might hear in the garden instead of in the garden. In Cumbria, you find it pronounced with t, with no vowel whatsoever um, after it. So it's not like t apple, t cut, it's t apple, t cut. And this sometimes leads to consonant clusters that aren't allowed in standard English. I think in later Cumbria, the most complicated consonant cluster I've managed to make is t'gliavenfwok, which means the digging people. Although um, whether that's actually a consonant cluster that would ever occur depends on something I will mention later in the video. And in other parts of the north, it's been reduced even further. So instead of just being t, it's just a glottal plosive or a glottal stop. And a glottal stop is a restriction of air in the glottis, which is an opening almost at the larynx right down in the throat. So that's the gap in the middle of the word when some British speakers say water, water. The glottal stop occurs in a lot of English dialects, including my own, but it's normally an allophone of a pre-existing phoneme, like the t phoneme. Um, so I'll, I'll put a little thing on screen whenever I say glottal stop in this sentence. So in the park, in these accents, comes out something like int park. Int park. Int park. The glottal stop can be difficult to hear if you don't have it in your native language, but it's not in park, it's int park. Int park. So you, you close off the airflow very suddenly at the end of in, so it becomes int, int. So how do we analyse this from a grammatical point of view? Well, it's harder than you'd think, because English phonotactic rules, which are the sort of unspoken rules that govern what is and isn't allowed in English phonology, do not allow syllables that don't have a nucleus. And the nucleus is usually a vowel or very occasionally a sonorant consonant like l. For example, in some pronunciations of the word kettle, kettle, the l acts as the nucleus of the second syllable, kettle. Kettle, so there's no actual vowel there in some pronunciations. But t is not a vowel. A syllable nucleus, at least in English, cannot be t. So if we analyse the northern definite article t 
as being a word in its own right, then it's a word with zero syllables, and that's not allowed either. So it has to be attached to another word. And that's not unheard of even in Germanic languages. So all standard North Germanic languages, Swedish and Norwegian, and I think Icelandic as well, have the definite article attached to the end of the word, attached to the end of the noun that it modifies. So you have, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Fogel, which means bird, but Forgon, which means the bird. So rather than having the definite article and then the noun, you just have the noun in a definite form, modified by a kind of inflection that used to be the definite article. But from a phonological perspective, is this actually the soundest way of analysing it? So to explain what I mean, in dialects that have it, including northern dialects, the glottal stop, among other things, is an allophone of the t phoneme. So in certain phonological environments, you pronounce this phoneme as t, but in other environments you pronounce it as a glottal stop. And there are rules governing how this works in the accents that it happens in. So among other things, it's realised as t at the start of a word, and a glottal stop at the end of a word or before an unstressed syllable. But the definite article never occurs in the middle of a word, so we'll ignore the unstressed syllable thing for now. So if I say in house, I'm pronouncing it as a glottal stop, which means it must be at the end of the word in, not at the start of the word house. This might be very obvious to a lot of northerners, but it's an interesting thing because instead of modifying the noun to make it definite, you modify the word that comes before the noun, whatever that word is, which is quite interesting. Even in dialects where it's realised as a t rather than a glottal stop, it's, it's, it's still attached to the end of the previous word. So in my granddad's accent, um, which doesn't really use a glottal stop at all, or it does but not, in, not as an allophone of t, he, um, if he's trying to think of a noun and he pauses before the noun, he will say the definite article before the pause, not after the pause. So he'll always say it's in t um, shed rather than it's in um, shed. But that's just a bit of anecdotal evidence. There are complications in situations where the word before the noun ends in a T phoneme. That is the sound T or a glottal stop, because that would cause a situation of what's called consonant gemination, which is where a consonant is held for twice as long. And that's not allowed in English in any dialect I'm aware of. So some northern dialects deal with this by having the definite article just get swallowed up by the word before the noun. So for example, at pub or at pub. So the definite article just isn't pronounced at all in that situation. The strangest thing about it to me is how this happened. So the change from the to just th is easy enough to explain because it's just the deletion of a vowel in an unstressed syllable and that happens absolutely everywhere in English. And reduction of that kind has historically been more common in the north than the south. So that makes perfect sense. The thing that confuses me is the reduction of th to t. Because on a phonological level the word the doesn't actually have T in it. We use TH spellings to represent the um, TH and THE sounds, but the sounds themselves aren't related to T at all. They're articulated in a completely different way and at you know, different places in the mouth. It's tempting to say that people might have just been going on the spelling, but it's I can't stress enough how unusual it is for the pronunciation of core vocabulary common words in a language to be influenced by spelling. So the only influence spelling has had on our speech really is where it concerns words that we don't say very often or words that we see written more than we hear spoken. But that's absolutely not the case with the. Um, the is the most commonly spoken word in English by a mile and that's ignoring the fact uh, that, that in the 1600s and 1700s if the average person in rural England could read and write they definitely weren't doing that as much as we do now. So it could be a phonological change, a systematic change to the sound th that changes it to and that is perfectly possible. So the problem is that we don't really see this change anywhere else in modern northern English. And sound change is normally systematic, so you'd expect it to apply wherever its conditions are met. So you wouldn't just expect the to become t. You'd also expect them to become something like tum or something like that. And as it happens, we do actually find spellings that suggest this might have been true in at least some northern dialects in the 1700s. So Agnes Wheeler, who's a Cumbrian writer, um, not only Cumbrian, but a very, very conservative form of Cumbrian that preserved a lot of vowels from before the Great Vowel Shift. She spells these clitic words that I've mentioned like this, um, as though that change is taking place more systematically. And what I mean by a clitic word is a word that's totally unstressed within a sentence and relies on the stress of the words around it. So in the sentence, the tiger killed them, 
The words the and them are clitics because they carry no stress at all. There are no stress syllables in those words. So it might be that in the clitic forms of words like the and them, the the sounds were reduced to t, and that the definite article is the only one of those that has survived. Uh, but that's just one idea about how it might have come about. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm, I'm at university at the time. This is, I think I'm at university at the time. This is going to be put out. I might not be there yet, depending on what order I do things in. Um, but I've recorded a, a little backlog of videos for while I'm at university, mostly readings and things. But while I'm there, I'll probably do a, a bit of a question and answer thing, just so that I can film it on my phone and not feel guilty about the horrible um, video quality. So if anybody has any questions to ask, they can um, put them in the description. Bear in mind, I, d I really don't know much about Celtic languages. I'm not equipped to answer questions about Celtic languages, really, um, unfortunately, although I know that is a big point of interest for a lot of people. Um, it's mainly the development of English, Old English, possibly English dialect, and things like that. And archaeology as well. Um, but uh, again, I have specific areas in archaeology that I know about, and you know, not much about any other areas. But, but yeah. So yeah, I will talk to you soon.